Awesome. Thank you very much. Great. Alrighty. Next up, and the next speaker will be Ryan yeah, Levick. Ah, here he is, Ryan. Hi, Ryan. <laughs> we have the honor to have Ryan as our first ever speaker at our Rust Linz meetup. He kicked it off half a year ago. And uh, yeah, Ryan is a principal cloud developer advocate at Microsoft. Ryan is I would say a kind of Mr. Rust at Microsoft. And we would want to say a big thank you to you, Ryan, for taking the time for an Ask Me Anything session tonight. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Yeah. So Ryan will start with a quick overview about uh, his Rust-related work at Microsoft, and then we go up uh, into a, in a Q&A session. Um, so this is, again, for you folks out there. If you have any questions about, about Ryan, about Rust, about Rust and Microsoft, about Ryan and Microsoft, and all the other permutations that you can think of, uh, put them into Discord. We are gladly picking them up and, and going to um, ask him to Ryan directly. So Ryan, stage is yours. Awesome. Yeah, so I think before uh, we get into the, the, the Q&A, it's important to really understand why Rust and Microsoft really come together at all. Um, and in case you haven't heard about it, um, this really all started several years ago when our security team at Microsoft started to take a look at why we were having um, security issues in the first place, to really start addressing the issue ahead of time instead of constantly going and finding bugs after the fact um, and solving them that way. And when our security team actually went through with that, what they found was that a large majority of the uh, security issues that we were finding at Microsoft were due to memory safety issues. And memory safety, what that means is the correct or incorrect use of memory. Um, so if you think back, if you've ever done any C programming and, or C++ programming um, in your life, um, then you know that sometimes you might have a pointer to some memory and you, uh, you know, you free it and then afterwards you use it again and that's that's incorrect or um, you know you don't have a garbage collector there to to really make sure that you're using memory uh, correctly and it turns out that this is a huge reason why at Microsoft we uh, end up with security vulnerabilities um, and you know after we announced this to the world our finding we found out that we're not alone um, it turns out that across the industry um, basically everybody has this issue. Um, especially when, with companies that are using um, software at kind of lower levels of the stack. Um, and so uh, we went about trying to figure out how best to, to solve this. Um, and we think we may have landed uh, on the answer. And that answer might be, um, might be Rust, because Rust allows you to write this kind of low-level system software um, where you don't have the luxury of being able to use a, a, a runtime that might have a garbage collector to help you out with this memory. Um, uh, but still be able to be sure that you're you're not falling into these old traps that we've uh, followed in, into in, in the past. Um, and uh, now at Microsoft, what we're doing is really trying to see how well this can work. And um, you know, we're not a small company, um, and uh, so it's it's not as easy as just saying, "Well, you know, we'll try it out and hope for the best." Um, we really have to uh, take this stuff seriously. Um, and so now we're going through that due diligence and really trying to figure out, um, can Rust work at the scale of, of a Microsoft, uh, of, a, of a billion dollar software company that, that does everything from embedded devices that you know, run on your refrigerator all the way up to mainframe servers. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm happy to talk about it today, but so far, you know, we're not done by any stretch of the imagination, but the experiment is going quite well. Um, and, and hopefully, um, for the rest of the time that we have here, we can talk a little bit about that. And I look forward to, to people's questions about, um, what Rust looks like and, and kind of the, uh, I, I don't want to use the dirty word enterprise, but in an enterprise setting, uh, what does, what does that actually look like? Um, so with that, I think, yeah, we'll get back to the questions and, and uh, see where we go with the conversation. All righty. Very good. Thank you, Ryan. Let's see. So people, everybody out there, keep the questions coming. You can use the Discord server. We will take a look at the question and ask the questions to, to Ryan. Uh, and I, if it, here we have a question. Um, 
There is a personal, there is a question coming in through the chat here. And uh, I think Nick is asking, um, are we mainly writing new apps in Rust or also rewriting existing ones in Rust? And what is the, the difficult part here? And I guess we as Microsoft in that case? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so um, this, is a, this is a very interesting question. It's, um, it's, it's usually easier to write something from scratch, right? Um, typically, uh, you know, everyone is trying to get rid of their old legacy systems and start writing something new. That's usually the more fun thing to do. Um, and so um, that's certainly an approach that we want to take. We're always writing new software uh, at Microsoft. Um, and uh, you know you can't um, kind of uh, you know change the world if you don't start somewhere. Um, and so yeah, we will be starting uh, by writing new software um, in Rust, um, changing existing software uh, to from one language into another is also a possibility and something that we're, we've also done and have explored. Um, this is definitely the more uh, difficult approach. Um, because you often run into the um, the need to interact with existing software. Um, and that's something that we can talk about is one of the, the difficulties with um, bringing Rust into a large um, existing code base, or, or in the case of Microsoft, thousands of code bases, um, is that we have existing code there. Um, and um, as anybody knows who's tried to bring a new language into an existing code base, there are, there are some difficulties there. Um, Rust is really good at uh, interacting with with plain C, um, and and uh, if you've if you've done that before, you'll know that kind of Rust has a first class capacity for interacting with existing C code. Um, but it's not really the case for for C++ or for C Sharp or, or other languages. Um, and that requires more work on the, the part of, um, of developers to, to kind of get it right. Um, and so this is something we're exploring. How do we, how do, we do that? How do we um, interact with existing code? Um, but um, at the end of the day, we're going to have a mixture uh, of new applications written in Rust and um, existing software that has either been updated or completely rewritten um, in, in Rust as well. Okay, um, I, I have one that really fr very frequently comes up when I discuss uh, Rust with other developers. And many people have the, the view on that, that they say, hey, just use modern C++. <laughs> That's fine. I don't need Rust because with all the modern C++ stuff, C++ is as safe as Rust is. What is your take on that? Um, there's a lot of evidence to point to the contrary, um, <laughs> but I will I will start with saying yes. Uh, modern C plus plus can be and is uh, safer than um, plain C or older versions of C plus plus. So if you don't have the choice, then by all means um, try and adopt uh, modern C plus plus best practices uh, the best you can. Um, the problem with that um, is that uh, this is completely kind of opt-in. Um, it's very hard to uh, enforce this kind of at a system-wide or company-wide level to only use modern features uh, of C++. C++ is not really set up in a way that says, okay, if you use old features, give warnings or something like that. And if you use new features, um, then you know, everything is fine. Um, and on top of that, the new features of C++ are safer than older features of C++, but I would not classify them as safe. So there are a lot of uh, features of C++ that are um, uh, where it is still possible to, to run into issues, even if you're kind of um, you know, doing the right thing and using uh, newer versions. Um, so you know, there's not a simple answer here. It's, not, uh, it's definitely not a, a, the answer is not to just drop all the C and C++ that has ever been written and rewrite everything in Rust. Uh, we would be doing nothing but rewriting uh, code for a very, very long time. Um, but at the same time, I think everybody who is currently using C and C++ definitely should um, be considering uh, Rust uh, as, a, as a language 
um, looking into it and seeing um, if it uh, has the potential for adding extra security on, on top of them. And the answer might be um, when you take a hard look at that, that um, it's not worth it or it's too difficult or um, or where you're using C and C++ right now, um, it's, it's, you know, it's fine if, uh, if things are not completely locked down and completely memory safe. You have a hardened piece of code, for instance, that's been running for 20 years. You don't need to go ahead and rewrite that um, in Rust today. Um, so T, C and C++ are not going anywhere, um, but at, this, uh, at the same time, um, there, there is a, a definite good reason for this being a new language as opposed to um, just trying to adopt uh, the, the new rules of how to write modern C++. Uh, great. Yeah, there, there's another question that just came in from from AB. Um, um, especially with with the teams that develop projects in Rust, can you describe um, uh, the level of experience the teams have, uh, and if there are any significant obstacles to struggle with when adopting Rust or when switching to Rust? Yeah. So um, the teams that we have we've been working with so far on uh, adoption of Rust have ex uh, have significant experience at the team level, at least, in system software. Mm -hmm. So they're mainly coming from a C and C++ background, um, among other things. Um, and there will typically be at least um, a few very senior engineers on the team working on this. Um, with that being said, um, there are a few there are a few obstacles and there are a few non-obstacles, um, I would say. The, the first non-obstacle that I would like to talk uh, about because it comes up very quite often is the learning curve uh, of Rust. Uh, learning Rust is, um, is certainly non-trivial. Um, you won't pick it up in a day, um, but it, especially for engineers who have background in, in C and C++, we find that um, they become uh, productive in the language pretty quickly um, with, within the range of being as productive or close to as productive as they felt in C and C++ within the three weeks to a month range, um, which is which is certainly, you know, a, a non-trivial price, but something that, you know, is a one-time cost for that, that engineer, and then they're up and running. Um, and uh, so that's something that we, we don't really struggle with. Um, people tend to be able to learn it um, relatively quickly. Um, beyond that, um, one thing, one place where teams can sometimes struggle um, that I've already uh, talked about is um, interrupt with the existing systems. So um, if there is um, a, a large piece of code, trying to figure out how Rust can fit into that existing system can sometimes be difficult um, because particularly in code bases that are not well factor factored or maybe not super modular, um, it can be difficult to, to find out where exactly one should place or start rewriting or writing new Rust um, because it's not like creating a new class in C++. You have to have well-defined interfaces um, where uh, it's it's easy to interrupt between Rust and the existing code. Um, and, and particularly in production systems, sometimes that's not the easiest thing to find. Um, so I would say that's certainly the most difficult part is figuring out where Rust fits into the existing system. Um, we You spoke a lot about people coming from C and C++ uh, uh, to Rust. Uh, which which seems like a natural transition and and the same you know area of of, of problems they they want to solve. Um, what I see when when looking at uh, the community is that also a lot of people uh, who are coming from Go um, are adopting Rust uh, um, at scale now. Um, uh, what should they look out for when adopting Rust if they are in this you know um, um, garbage collected, uh, um, very conven uh, convention oriented programming language to this Go? Yeah. Yeah, we have also um, a, a few teams that, uh, at Microsoft as well that are coming from, let's say, higher level uh, languages or non-C um, and C++ languages um, adopting Rust. And in particular, there's one that's working on the, the Crustlet project, which is WebAssembly and Kubernetes uh, project, which you should definitely check out, um, where most of the developers on that team are Go developers um, or and have other language backgrounds not in C and C++ um, in their background. 
Um, and uh, of course, you know, sometimes it takes them a little bit longer to get up to the full level of productivity than it would uh, for you know somebody coming from a systems background, but they do uh, manage to learn. And I think the important thing uh, when learning Rust from that background is to take a step back and realize that Rust requires at first a little bit of a, a small bit of theoretical uh, knowledge um, in order to get up and running with it, particularly around how it handles memory. So um, I've seen often, I, I teach Rust quite often, when people really, really struggle with the borrow checker, for instance, they struggle because they just want to jump in and just start writing code because that's what they're used to. Um, and there are plenty of languages out there where it is possible to just jump in. I learned Go, for instance, to a reasonable degree of proficiency in a day, and I was writing code. Um, and that's great. Um, and that's a, a real kind of strength of Go as a programming language. Rust, I would not classify as, as being that. I think it's important to um, take, you know, um, maybe an hour or two to sit down and, and read and try and understand how Rust thinks about memory before jumping in and writing code. And then, you know, write some code, hack on something, try and get something to work. And if you run into issues uh, with it, then don't be afraid to take a deep breath, take a step back and go back um, and, and read a bit more or try and learn a bit more of, of the theory uh, th that kind of stands behind Rust um, before you, you go forward. Um, there's a real tension when learning Rust uh, about um, uh, the how much the compiler, how much you're fighting against the compiler. And I think the the real key to uh, to learning Rust is realizing that the compiler really is there to be your friend. Um, most, I'd say, you know, between ninety to ninety nine percent of the time when you're writing code and you get a compiler error message. The compiler is right um, and is trying to point out that you're actually, you know, might be making a mistake here. Um, uh, at sometimes it's a little too conservative and and might uh, end up uh, preventing you from doing something that is it would be totally fine. But most of the time, it's really being helpful. And the error messages in Rust are something that are absolutely wonderful. Take the time, read the error messages, which I've noticed a lot of people come from languages where. Mm -hmm. you, you shouldn't read the error messages. They'll just confuse you. And so people will <laughs> skip over them. Um, okay. In Rust, take the time, read the error message, try and understand what it's trying to say to you and, and figure out how you can apply that to, um, to future problems. Um, if you can do that, if you can take a deep breath and get through the initial hump, if you're uh, if you're coming from a, a higher level language, I think you'll you'll notice after after a little while that you're starting to become uh, productive, and then you reach a point where, um, me personally, I'm I'm more productive in Rust than any other language, um, just because it gives me confidence when I write the code and it compiles. I'm already you know ninety percent of the way there, whereas in other languages, you know, if I hadn't written a test, this thing might, you know, crash at the very first. You know, line, and I have no idea. Um, but Rust gives me that confidence. I guess it was um, Steve Klebnik who, who said once that we shouldn't call it fighting the compiler, but rather debugging at compile time, which is a very nice metaphor because those bugs hit you uh, uh, way, way later when when this you know uh, when the software is in production when you don't want the bugs to hit you. Yeah. Uh, and debugging at compile time is a really, really nice way of calling that and uh, time well spent, I guess. Yeah, uh, that, that kind of reminds me of a, a question I often get um, from new teams adopting uh, Rust at Microsoft is, how is the debugger support? Um, and, you know, we start off with the debugger support is, is fine. It's, you know, there's still a lot of work that could be done to make it even better than it is, but it mostly works because it because a Rust binary is mostly like a C and C++ binary. So it kind of just works out of the box. Um, but I'm always tempted to say, but, you know, <laughs> that's, you know, you're probably thinking you're going to be using the debugger all the time because that's what you do when you write C and C++ code. I almost never use a debugger uh, in Rust um, because most of the time my, my code works relatively well out of the box because I've, you know, I've debugged at compile time using the compiler. Mm -hmm. um, and when it doesn't work, um, it's usually a small logic error. And then, you know, it's easier to just throw in some print line 
uh, print line statements in there, and and I can I can more easily go that way. So, I you know debugging at compile time really is it. Uh, you don't need to debug at runtime because the compiler will help you uh, at compile time for sure. Oh, I love the statement about the print line statements. So the, um, I'm coming from JavaScript. I'm a console log debugger. So that's, <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. Ryan, we have another question from the community, which I think uh, is, is exactly the right one for you. Somebody is asking about the Windows crate. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about the Windows crate. And the specific question is, will Microsoft internally use the Windows crate for building Windows software with Rust? Yeah, so for those that don't know, we recently announced um, the, the new Windows Crate. Um, and uh, what it is is a crate that allows you to use basically any Windows API in Rust. Um, and uh, if you've not done Windows programming before, then you might not be aware that the Windows API is very large because it's very old. Um, some of the APIs have been around since the 80s, and they're still there in all their glory. Uh, and that means there are hundreds of thousands, if not, I, I don't know if anybody even knows the number, but there are potentially millions of APIs for interacting with Windows. Um, and up until now, if you had a new language like Rust, um, then and you wanted to interact with the with the Windows um, API in some way, the what you would have to do is by hand go through the documentation and create bindings for that API. Um, and now what we have is metadata that describes these APIs in a machine readable way. And the Windows Crate is a, is a really fantastic tool, uh, mainly written by my colleague Kenny Kerr, for reading this metadata and producing Rust code um, that allows you to talk to uh, various Windows APIs. And for those that are familiar with Windows, this is everything from Win32 through COM, through WinRT. So any kind of Windows API, old and new, um, you can use this crate for, um, for interacting with it. Um, and uh, on the question of whether we're going to be using this internally uh, for building software, the answer is 100% yes. Uh, we will absolutely be using this internally. There's a bunch of teams already asking about it. We're very excited about this internally um, for, for writing Rust code. Um, I do want to give a quick shout out to um, the Win API crate, which until now has been the community's answer for interacting with, with Windows. There's been a lot of work by the community um, on by hand creating these bindings for Rust. Um, and um, while I do think at some point the Windows crate will kind of supersede that crate and, and offer all the functionality that it does, we're still kind of a preview uh, state for the Windows Crate right now. You will likely run into bugs. Please use it and file bugs so we know how, uh, which bugs to fix. Um, but the Win API Crate was was really great and is, has been the foundation um, that the Rust community has relied on for interacting with Windows up until this point. So thank you to to, to that team and that community um, for doing that, and we look forward to working with them. Um, you know, as we go forward. Uh, from from here, um, but absolutely, we're going to be using this uh, internally for all of our Windows programming needs. Thank you for providing this API. I'm still absolutely. haunted by my Win API C uh, uh, adventures 20 years ago, <laughs> so I can close this chapter. <laughs> yeah, one one thing I'd like to to say as well on top of this that I'm very excited about is these are just kind of the raw bindings to the Windows APIs, um, and especially for the old style Win32 APIs, they're just C bindings. So it's a lot of unsafe code. It's a lot of raw pointers and stuff like that. One thing I'm particularly looking forward to is working with the community on creating safe wrappers around these APIs. What will the world look like when we have Rust Windows APIs that are fully safe, fully idiomatic, but just as performant as the C APIs that they wrap? Um, that's going to be a great day when you can write Windows applications that are as close to the metal as they've ever been, raw performance. It's going to be great, but it's 100% safe and a really great developer um, experience. Um, I'm looking forward to the community uh, working with us on on getting to that dream. That's going to be that's going to be a great day. Awesome! I have a short follow up on that. You mentioned the 
old Win32 APIs multiple times just to make sure. The Windows Crate also covers the, the new ones, the Windows 10 APIs, and it will be refreshed whenever new APIs come to Windows 10, won't they? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the great thing, like I said, is that this is all generated from metadata. So the Windows Crate itself doesn't really know anything about Windows APIs. It simply knows how to read in this metadata and produce Rust code uh, based on that metadata. And then we have a team, and this, there's also an open source um, repository for this as well, producing this metadata based on the APIs. And we can add more to this metadata. Um, hopefully in the future, we'll add more annotations to be able to make it even safer um, and produce better Rust code from it. Um, and this is uh, the same metadata that's being used by C Sharp tooling, by C++ tooling. So they're all using the same metadata pr to produce these bindings. Um, and that includes everything from you know, APIs that were created in the 80s all the way up until the next version of Windows when it comes out, the metadata will be updated and those new APIs will be available from day one um, in, in Rust as well. Mm -hmm. cool. We have another one. Um, which one? Let's take this one, I think. Um, at Microsoft, um, is Rust mostly used in projects that would otherwise have been written in C, C++, or is it also replacing code that is more dynamic, like code coming from Python or Ruby or something like this? Um, it's mostly being used for code that is... Um, uh, it looks like we have a visitor here. Hello. <laughs> um, it's mostly being <laughs> mostly being used uh, for code that would previously have been written in C and C++. Uh, so uh, this is typically low-level code, code that is you know running close to the metal. We have uh, C Sharp um, at, at Rust as well, uh, or at Microsoft as well, um, as a language that we often use for application development. Um, and, um, and, you know, it's a great language that um, we, we don't have any plans of, of replacing. Um, and so really, this is a kind of a, a focused effort on, um, on low level code, particularly code that is security sensitive as well, uh, where replacing a C and C++ code base in Rust would have a lot of benefit for the security of the system, because once it's written preferably in 100% safe Rust, we can be sure that that code is and forever will be 100% memory safe. We don't need to run fuzzers on it. We don't need to have security specialists look at it for memory safety issues. Um, and we can we can really kind of focus on, on other things. Um, as far as replacing code bases that are written in higher level languages, uh, particularly C Sharp um, or even JavaScript or something like that, um, I'm not going to say that that won't be impossible uh, in particular situations. Uh, WebAssembly comes to mind as a, as a potential where maybe we take something that was written in JavaScript or even uh, in C Sharp and, and write it in Rust for particular use cases. Um, but this is, I don't want to give the impression that we're trying to uh, only write Rust at, at Microsoft. We have and always, we are and have always been a multi-language company, and we're going to continue to be that in the future. It just means that we are trying to bring uh, Rust into the family as well, in addition to the langu languages that we already have. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. We have uh, uh, one question that is in the same area, I would say. What do you think, Stefan? The one about Rust and special yeah. work areas, right? Um, somebody's asking whether Microsoft will use Rust focused on special work areas like network drivers, kernels, or are you also thinking about developing more uh, end user applications, maybe workloads like web APIs, also in the context of maybe cloud computing, Azure, things like that. What are those work areas where you plan to use Rust primarily? Yeah, that's a that's a very uh, good question. I think um, you know it's 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 too early now to say exactly where Rust will end up really finding uh, its home inside of Microsoft. We're at the beginning stages of this kind of deep exploration into into Rust, um, but um, 
I would say as far as possibility goes, all of the above are certainly uh, possible. Well, we are very interested in looking at Rust um, in terms of uh, kernel development. Um, I would say that Rust isn't quite there yet uh, fully. Um, kernel development has a bunch, when you, when you don't have an operating system, there's a bunch of things that you have to worry about, especially when you're writing the operating system. And when you're writing the operating system that runs on billions of computers, there are certain features um, that you need to be able to rely on um, from the language uh, that Rust uh, sometimes um, doesn't, doesn't yet have. Um, one particular example, if you're curious ab uh, about such a uh, thing, is in Rust, when you allocate uh, new memory inside of a collection, like you have the vector type in Rust is a collection of things. Um, if you push something onto that vector, it might allocate memory. Um, and that's great. Um, most of the time, you don't care about that. Uh, but in the kernel, um, if you try to allocate memory and you run out of memory, you don't want to do what Rust does currently by default, which is panic, crash the program. <laughs> we don't want to crash the the, uh, the kernel when we run out of memory. We want to handle that. Um, and Rust doesn't have uh, good support for that in the standard library right now or in its allocation library for, for handling that. It's it's there, but it's not um, you know it's not up to the level that we want to see. So we want to continue working with the Rust community on evolving things like that, on making Rust uh, going from Rust as being like a interesting but slightly risky choice for kernel development to a no brainer. Um, and there are certain um, there are certain uh, domains now where Rust is uh, a no brainer. Um, working, I think, on certain network applications. Um, standalone applications uh, where you just need something to run quickly. Um, Rust can oftentimes be a no-brainer in, in those contexts and, and other um, ones. It's not quite there yet to be a no-brainer. And that's what we're doing at Microsoft right now is trying to figure out what those domains are, where it is a no-brainer, what the domains are, where it's not, um, making that decision so that teams internally know when and when not to use Rust, and then working with the community to kind of expand out which domains Rust is the no-brainer in, so that hopefully years from now, um, almost all domains where C and C++ are a no-brainer, Rust is a no-brainer as well. Um, so there's, there's one, one topic that um, um, comes up when we talk about Rust a lot, uh, which goes away from the technical aspects more to, to the organizational aspects, what we've seen with Nell uh, um, earlier. Uh, what can you tell us about the Rust Foundation that's coming? So this is this is something that has been talked about a lot in the last couple of months, um, especially with the announcement that Mozilla is, is, is shutting down the, the Rust uh, uh, department, or if not shutting down, reducing uh, uh, the investment there. Uh, everybody's eyes. Uh, uh, looks at the Rust Foundation, right? Yeah. So, um, from a from an official Microsoft uh, capacity, I can't say too much about the foundation because we haven't announced anything, um, and I, I don't want to make any announcements here tonight. That's uh, that's not what I'm here for. Uh, but um, from a, we're certainly excited uh, about the the Rust Foundation. Um, this is just the next step in um, in Rust becoming a uh, an even more established language. We want to be able to rely on Rust as a as a real production grade billion dollar company type of language, and a foundation is just one piece uh, in in that. Um, particularly, also, um, the, I think the foundation will be um, just a, a really great way of Rust continuing to be what it is, uh, an awesome open source community. Um, and, and the hope there is that it just continues down that path. Um, so uh, from the Microsoft perspective, there's just nothing but um, just an intense um, uh, curiosity and desire to see uh, it go on. But I have nothing official beyond that to say. On a personal level, I'm also ecstatic uh, about the Rust Foundation. Um, just because um, it's, again, proof that uh, uh, the language will be able to exist um, independent of, um, of any one company or, or um, any one team or anything like that. Um, I often think about this uh, when you think about C, for instance, um, or let's take COBOL as a language. <laughs> 
I've never written COBOL. I don't even think I've read COBOL before. I'm not even sure I could tell you what COBOL even looks like. <laughs> um, I have no opinions about COBOL, but let's say I hate COBOL and I wish it didn't exist <laughs> uh, just for the sake of argument. Um, uh, even if I wish COBOL didn't exist as a language, I wish it would go away. There's nothing I could do to make that uh, true. There's so much COBOL that's been written in this world and it's not going to go away anytime soon. It would be a massive investment to get rid of it. Um, the same is true for C um, or C++. Um, you know, we certainly at Microsoft don't want to see C++, or C++ go away anytime soon. Um, uh, and even if we did, it would be that wouldn't even be possible. C and C++ will be around for a very long time to come, and we're going to continue to support it because the industry and humanity now relies on these languages at a very deep level. Um, uh, I would like to see Rust get to some kind of, of point with that. Um, we and you know when I first joined the Rust community or when I first started writing Rust in in 2015 ish, um, you know no one cared about th this language except for a few hackers and some people at Mozilla and then it became 1.0 and then a few more people cared and it became a little bit important to Mozilla as a company and more companies started to adopt it and so you could say okay you know if Rust went away today it would be sad and some companies would have to pay a lot of money to rewrite it in another language, but it would it would still be possible. We're finally getting to the point where Rust is going to be impossible to get rid of. Rust is here to stay. Even if you want it, wish that it didn't exist, the, the truth of the matter is it, it does exist. And, it's, and the foundation is kind of another sign of that being true, that it is a language that can last for decades and, and beyond um, into the future. Cool. That reminds me that um, we had a COBOL meetup in Linz once back when we were able to do in-person meetups. And we did it as an April Fool's joke. But then somebody showed up who developed uh, an IDE for COBOL in Linz. There's a company in Linz who did, develops IDEs for COBOL. Nice. And we were all very surprised. So it, um, <laughs> you're totally right. That reached that level that people are still still very concerned about that. Yeah. All righty. Um, I guess we have time for one more question or, or maybe one or two more questions. Um, yeah, I think we, we, we still are fine with one or two questions. I think we have to stop yeah. sharp at 9.30, but we okay. still have a few minutes. Which one would you like to do, Stefan? Um, I think so. So there are two questions that I, that I like. Um, and, and one, um, since you have seen a lot of people coming to Rust internally and externally, lots of projects being started or being transferred, um, uh, people coming from all different kinds of programming languages. If you have beginner Rust developers, what kind of projects would you recommend for them to do to work on? Um, this is a very good question. And I, 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 hate to give such an answer, but the answer really is it depends. depends. Okay. Um, but let me let me try and provide a little bit more of a helpful answer than that. Um, the important thing when learning any language is to work on a project where you care about the project and want to work on it. Because if you're not motivated, then you won't work on it. You won't learn. So definitely starting by picking um, a project that you care about is 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 number one. Um, if you're looking for ideas um, about projects to work on, I I don't think I mentioned this. I personally I come from a a higher level language background. Before I was writing uh, Rust, I was writing uh, Ruby and Haskell, Scala, um, various functional programming languages as well, um, and. One thing that drew me to Rust was the ability to get into low, quote unquote, low level programming um, in a way that where I didn't feel like, um, I didn't feel intimidated because C and especially C++ really intimidated me as, as languages. Not only the languages themselves, but also the community. Um, you know, they're hardcore hackers and I'm not one, so I don't want them to make fun of me. Um, Rust didn't feel like that. And, and luckily, I think today it still doesn't feel like that. So if you're coming from that background, you might want to look into writing something low level. Um, you know, pick something that somebody's done before. It's totally fine to be completely unoriginal. 
Um, there are plenty of fantastic tutorials out there. One that I'm reading again for the fifth time um, is uh, the blog OS uh, um, project uh, by Philip Oppenheimer. Um, and uh, it's building an operating system in Rust, which at first sounds completely intimidating, but it's not. It's very straightforward. Operating systems are kind of easy, at least at, at, to build a, uh, a basic one, right? Um, and, and there's so many fantastic and weird, uh, trivial uh, details that you can learn about computers from building your own operating system. Um, pick something like that. Or maybe you want to build a database uh, or a text editor or something fun and low level, something that you know you've used your whole career. Um, and you can finally build that core piece of technology that you've let other people write for you. You can build it yourself because now you are a systems programmer. Um, uh, and if all else fails, then just pick a project you've worked on before. Um, don't, don't be afraid. Just write code and have fun. That's a very good recommendation. I think we couldn't have a better close. <laughs> that was so <laughs> great. Such a great ending of this great evening. We could listen to you for hours, Ryan, and we have to say thank you for being here. Unfortunately, we are now quickly running out of time. It was great, Stefan, don't you think? Absolutely. I enjoyed it a lot. It was a lot of fun. And I learned so much. So it, it was so, uh, even, even if I didn't ask questions or anything, I just was hooked on what you folks, Nell and you, Ryan, have, have said today. So um, this is going to be a video that I'm going to plug a lot of times when I'm going to talk to people, I'm sure. <laughs> thank you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, and from, from us also a big thank you to the whole audience, to all viewers, to those of you who contributed questions.